Welcome back to Highly Respected. I'm your host, Scott Greer, and today we're, of course, going to have an incredible episode, especially since we had a nice holiday weekend. As I explained in last week's IQ supplement, Labor Day is one of those real holidays that we have to honor and appreciate. You know, everyone's out enjoying the final days of summer, enjoying the nice day off. I didn't want to interrupt it with, you know, some high intellectual content from Highly respected. We'll get that on when the work day comes. So we're going to have that today. And I hope you guys enjoy the weekend. And we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. Mainly two big things. And it's dealing with things that happened last week. And the first thing I want to go into. And the two big topics we're going to discuss today. We'll probably get into some other stuff. But the two big ones is Biden's uh, declaration of war on middle America and MAGA Republicans. MAGA Republicans. And Trump's, uh, will Trump be indicted? These are the two big questions today, very related, and they deal with a lot of topics we're going to discuss uh, for most of the podcasts. So hopefully we're, you're going to learn a lot today and you're going to be heavily informed after this subject. So the first thing I want to go into is to answering the question about Trump's possible indictment. Will he be indicted? What will happen if he's indicted? Are Democrats actually going to go forward with this? And I think I have argued in the past that I think Democrats are going to come short on it, that they've been too leery to go forward. Like they've had a lot of opportunities to go after Trump and they have, you know, retreated from that. You know, New York's, uh, New York's attorney general has appeared very committed to putting Trump in jail or indicting him on charges, dealing with his business um, and other things up in New York. Not really dealing with what he d- did in the White House, uh, but she backed away from it. She's not doing it, um, even though she's a very liberal black attorney general. Uh, she doesn't want to put Trump in jail. She she retreated or relented from her quest. And it looked like when he had left office that she was going to indict him. But it appears that that's not a possibility. And there's been so many other opportunities that they've had. I mean, even with. I mean, Democrats have been demanding charges for Trump ever since January 6th. The part, I mean, a big reason of the January 6th commission is to find the damning evidence to put Trump away. And, you know, Merrick Garland and Biden have been um, so far dragging their feet. I mean, even though people uh, want to say like, well, they're going too far. Yes, they're going too far from a Republican perspective, but from a Democrat perspective, they've been dragging their feet. And they've been very mad about it. So they've been demanding charges. Well, it appears that they're moving up the pace. And with the raid, I mean, when the FBI raid happened at Mar-a-Lago, I was like, you know what? I'm still not sold on that there's going to be indictment of Trump. And from early reports, it appeared that it had been a nothing burger what they had found. Well, it appears that they are wanting to say it's much more than a nothing burger. I mean, there's been developments over time. And I've said this in previous podcasts, like a lot of this stuff is really in the weeds. It feels like you're watching a prestige drama where you have to follow every episode and know all these characters to even follow along with the story. And news events will be like, there's this big event. Here's this character did this. And you're like, I don't know the basics of this. And so I'm not sure what this means. But there's been enough of developments over the past week where you can actually understand what's going on. And what the feds did is they released pictures of what they found, which it was kind of goofy. It's like top secret info uh, laying on the ground. And they have all these documents. It's like, this is what Trump was uh, withholding and keeping on his own. Now, you could argue that this stuff is still falls under executive privilege. Like maybe Trump had, you know, he had the right to keep those documents. You could say that. But the fact that the feds are releasing it and saying, this is what we got, this shows a great commitment to actually bring charges against Trump. They're not going to show their hand and just say, oh, well, you know, I guess he had executive privilege. We're not going to do this. The reason that they're so committed to this and they're fighting tooth and nail over Trump, uh, you know, trying to get different orders placed and uh, different initiatives placed in courts show in courts show that they want to bring charges. They are committed to it this time. It's a, They just need to build up the best case that they can. And so it's more, from my perspective, it's a matter of when rather than if they indict Trump. Now, there has been a new development that lowers the chances. If I had done this podcast, say, last Thursday or Friday, especially after Biden's speech, I would have said... 
the chances of Trump getting indicted are probably 90%. 90%. But there has been a new development that has lowered those chances. And uh, he, Trump got a win in court. He wants a special master. That's what they <laughs> referred to that, a special master. Uh, apparently, no one has told them that that's a problematic term, uh, using master. But they, he wants to use a special master to review all the documents to find whether which documents are... Uh, are, are are found to be under um, executive privilege and, you know, exclude that from the federal or the Department of Justice investigation. So this is a win. The Department of Justice did not want this. Maybe the special master finds that most of the documents within his possession, it was OK for him to have. And, you know, maybe there's not the obstruction of justice that they want to pursue against Trump, which is what they're trying to do. You know, it's uh, withholding federal evidence obstruction of justice these are the charges they're trying to hit with trump and the fact that they're saying the charges the specific charges and that they're you know releasing the photo the photos are a big deal and there are observers who are not total never trumpers or uh insane libtards who are saying that trump is probably getting an indictment bill barr who has turned on trump and actually i do need to make a point about bill barr before i carry on is Bill Barr is really one of these figures that um, irritates me because I, for years, I think for he was appointed in 2019 and throughout 2020, conservatives simp for this guy to an un, unprecedented level. They love this guy. They're like, he's so much better than Sessions. He's a wartime conservative. They love that term, wartime conservative. They don't use that too much anymore because it's it's very cringe now. But they're like, this guy really gets it. They held him up. He's like, and what did he really do? He like drank a water when he was uh, doing testimony before the Senate. Uh cool he played a bagpipe i don't know he didn't really do much of anything anybody's like he's really laying down the law uh not at all the only really good thing i can think of is that bill barr was very much worried uh during the george floyd riots that they were going to try to overthrow trump and he was getting bringing in or deputizing all these federal law enforcement to come to washington dc to protect the white house I don't think a lot of other attorney generals may have done that. But if you look at comparison between him and Jeff Sessions, who Jeff Sessions, now a lot of people like Jeff Sessions because everyone has shifted to being uh, neo-never Trumpers. While when Trump was in office, all these guys were massive Trump shills, huge Bill Barr shills, hated on Jeff Sessions. And now when Trump is out of office and they want to... Uh, you know, replace him with Ron DeSantis. They point out, I was like, look how Trump treated Jeff Sessions. He treated him terribly. How could we want this guy in office? Well, when in 2019 and 2020, they were all celebrating Trump dunking on Jeff Sessions and how weak Jeff Sessions is and how awesome Bill Barr is in comparison. Well, let's look at in comparison now. Even though Jeff Sessions has been, it was, you know, when he ran for the Senate, you know, Trump torpedoed his campaign. He really has a lot of reasons to be mad at Trump, but he's not going on TV talking about how uh, relishing the idea of Trump getting an indictment, how it's, you know, Trump is a threat to democracy and a threat to the republic. While Bill Barr is doing this, Bill Barr, the wartime conservative that everyone was loving, is now become a far worse anti-Trumper than Jeff Sessions. And Jeff Sessions kept, you know, his mouth shut, even though he has much more reason to have a grievance against Trump is that so all these and so i always want to remember is that all these people who loved all these figures like these same people also loved john bolton at one point in time they loved all these random terrible figures that were members of the trump white house they love stephanie grisham or who's now become an insane anti-trumper uh, press secretary and they also liked anthony scaramucci when he was press secretary for like a week and now all these people who are major trump shills and defended all like even like Trump's worst actions when he was in office now have become neo never Trumpers and and treat Trump like he's uh, like a like they're a jilted ex girlfriend of Trump and this is how they react and then they're like oh Bill Barr sucks it's like I can find a billion tweets of you loving Bill Barr and how he's awesome and this proves Trump is great from 2019 and 2020 and now you turn on the guy because. He, he turns out to not be based uh, wartime conservative as you thought. 
so that's just one thing I wanted to get out of the way about Bill Barr. And there's just so many figures like that. And so anytime I see these people complaining about Trump and the personnel that he surrounded himself with, and they point to Bill Barr and, and Anthony Scaramucci or John Bolton, I have to remind you have to be reminded that these same people supported all these some personnel decisions and they love them. So, I mean, not like Bill Barr was one of the worst Trump hires, but it does show that like afterwards, like these people have no loyalty and they want to get on TV. So they just trash Trump to stay on TV. And a lot of the people that people thought were terrible, such as Jeff Sessions and others, uh, were people that should have been kept in place. Uh, so a lot of things to consider here, uh, but I wanted to get that out of the way. So anyway, Bill Barr is one of those people saying that it's guaranteed that Trump is going to get indicted. Yeah, he's become anti-Trump, but he is not, he's not in the same categories like a Bill Crystal or David Frum or any of that, you know, and he still has somewhat of a reputation or some degree of respect that he is afforded by normal conservatives. He's saying that. Andrew McCarthy, a National Review writer who supported Trump both in 2016 and in 2020, uh, he's saying that an uh, indictment is lightly. Uh, he's been a lot cucky on a lot of things, but he's generally uh, about as centrist as a voice you can get, an objective voice you can get. He's been very, you know, horrified by January 6th and other things. But I think he's a former federal prosecutor. He knows how these things work, how the Department of Justice works, and he has been supportive of Trump in the past. I think he's about as objective an observer as you can get. And he says an indictment is likely to happen. So I think, and a lot of these people were, you know, skeptical of whether Trump should be impeached over his various offenses from the past. And now they're just saying, we think the Department of Justice is likely to indict him. These people know how the Department of Justice works, especially Bill Barr, he's a former attorney general. Uh, and so does a Andrew McCarthy. And they say that Trump is going to be indicted. So I think, I don't, th I would say it's not guaranteed. It's not 100%, but it's pretty likely. I mean, the, the special master ruling does lower the chances from 90%. How much it lowers the chances for, I'm not sure, but I still, I think it's pretty safe to say there's still well over a 50% chance that he's going to be indicted. I don't, th I think the one thing that has stopped it is that Trump is not going to be indicted before the election. They, they had already told the media that we're not going to do any big announcements 60 days before the election. I mean, of course, that could change, but I think the special master delays a lot of this stuff. They're probably, you know, the only time that they would have been able to meet within the 60 day time frame would have been this week. I think the special master ruling ensures that they're not going to do it this week. And so we'll have to wait till after the election to see what uh, to see a Trump indictment if it occurs. And so moving along to, you know, I'm pretty certain it is. I mean, they're showing their hand. They're pretty committed to this. You could say like, well, you know, Hillary Clinton did worse things. Well, you know, James Comey decided not to press any charges against Hillary. That was a very different scenario. First off, even though James Comey was, uh, you know, <laughs> not necessarily a full on Democrat partisan, at least at that time, or it appeared so, you know, he was operating under a Democrat regime, under a Democrat administration. They're not going to indict their own presidential nominee over missing emails. That was just not going to happen. OK, the two separate the party's not going to indict their own presidential nominee over that. That was just never going to happen. And whether it was like worse or not, I mean, that's that's a topic for another day. And that's really a topic I don't care about because, I mean, that's something for rest of conservative media to obsess over. And they're upset, going to obsess over for for <laughs> until the end of time. Uh, so I'm not even get into that. But now you have a Democrat administration that views Trump as a fundamental threat to democracy, the gravest threat to democracy in the history of a republic. Merrick Garland is a Democrat partisan. And these people are just going to say, uh, well, you know, we're just not going to arrest Trump. We're just not going to indict Trump. No, that's just not going to happen. They, there's no reason for them not to. Even if they have a weak case, they want to bring him on charges anyway, because they have to deliver that to their party. If Merrick Garland gets up there and, you know, he's like, well, for the safety of our republic, I've decided not to press charges. Democrats are going to be livid. Like, I could see Democrat House, if they still have control of the House, 
And if they still have the control of the Senate, try to impeach Merrick Garland. <laughs> like they would want Garland gone if he did not press charges. And Biden, see now Biden would demand, would fire Garland if he did not bring charges against Trump. There's no way there would be such a massive outcry if Garland didn't do it. And these are people he actually has to listen to. This is the Democrat media and the Democrat Party that would tell him that you are wrong and we are going to turn you into the worst enemy uh, possible when you do this. And it's a little bit different from Comey. I think Comey was like a moderate Republican and I think he just didn't want to do it. Or when he explained, you know, they, they both hated... Uh, uh, they both hated Comey and liked him. I mean, they hated Comey when he announced like a few weeks before the 2016 election, or I think it was like a week or two weeks before, you know, the reinvestigate, uh, reinvestigating Hillary Clinton. And people always said that this way, the election probably did have an effect, whether it was the decisive factor, it's hard to determine. Uh, but they always saw that him as the great evil. But I think it's like Comey wanted to appear nonpartisan. There's no... Of course, he failed in that endeavor, but there is no similar desire among the people in charge right now. They're not, they're just, if they have any chance of, of indicting Trump, there are. And also, they'd put him before a, what is likely a D.C. jury. Do you think a D.C. jury is going to be sympathetic to Trump? I mean, they could present the worst case possible and the D.C. jury would probably still convict Trump. They, and, the, and the DOJ knows this. It doesn't matter. I mean, the Trump's only hope if, if he got indicted is that he changes it to somewhere else in the country besides D.C. or New York City. But I don't know how that's going to work. I think that literally the only thing holding them back is that Democrats fe do fear mass violence and riots if they do indict Trump. They do live in fear of January 6th. I mean, it's not just... I mean, it, it, they do exploit it for all it's worth, but they really do fear the idea of January 6th. It still haunts them and gives them, you know, p trauma. It really did traumatize them. They have PTSD from January 6th, and they think it will happen again if they indict Trump. And they're very much worried about this. I mean, the all the talk about domestic white supremacy, terrorism, and all these things that they make about Trump, this is not just for show and political gain. I mean, yes, they do use it for political gain, but they actually genuinely believe this stuff. And the so they are worried about mass violence if this occurs. And, you know, people are threatening. I mean, like Lindsey Graham is threatening this, or saying it will happen. And they definitely take this threat seriously. I think that they're wrong to take this threat seriously. I've, I've argued that there probably won't be riots. One, uh, there's over 900 people who have been arrested in connection with January 6th. A lot of these people are the ones who would be like leading the riots or being the ones to go out and do this stuff. And those people are in jail right now or have served sentences. I don't think they're going to want to do this stuff again. Second, where would it occur? Like, where is it going to occur? I mean, most Trump supporters are out in the suburbs and rural America. They're not in an urban center. And they would have to gather in a specific place with like a set rally to do a riot. This is not like Black Lives Matter or anything like Antifa stuff where they're all in the city and they just like come to, a, you know, the city square or whatever and they start doing damage. These are people who would have to travel, you know, many hours possibly to go to riot so where are they gonna riot are they gonna riot in their nearby walmart or are they gonna riot in their suburb in their suburban cul-de-sac no they're not they're not gonna do that they're not gonna show up and they're just not gonna show up to a city center to do this now if there there probably will be a planned protest of this maybe in dc where the government will mobilize all of its resources to ensure that nothing happens. And what you could see is very much in similar what happened with that um, protest in 2021, uh, where they did a rally in support of the January 6th political prisoners, where there was like 100 people who came for the rally, and then there was like 1,000 or so law enforcement, and they had the National Guard on standby. And if there was a planned protest in D.C. to to object to Trump's uh, indictment, you would see like the whole federal government using its resources. Like National Guard would be there. Federal law enforcement would be there. Like every, there'd be thousands of law enforcement and guardsmen, possibly even soldier, federal soldiers, you know, U.S. Army troops in riot gear, ready to crack skulls if people came. 
And most likely only a few hundred people would show up because one thing is that conservatives think that anytime right wingers show up in public, that the feds must be behind this. They're obsessed with this idea. When this January 6th protest or protest in favor of the January 6th protesters happened, it was not wise, but it was not concocted by the feds. I mean, it was concocted by Matt Brainerd, who works on a lot of campaigns that these conservatives like. Like, this is not a guy working the for the federal government. And then every conservative pundit is like, this is clearly a fed op. Do not go. And probably wise advice not to go, but it was not a operation hatched by the federal government it was like hatched by a person that a lot of these people know and work with and they just sim simply went along with that and they keep using this theory anytime they see right wingers on public like any event like any protest they just immediately assume that it's feds behind this i mean they keep doing this with patriot front which once again i think i've said this before i think patriot fronts like demonstrations are silly and unproductive and you know a dumb but I don't think that they're like the federal government is like, hey, we need you out marching with shields in like Philadelphia or they were in Indianapolis. Like they're not telling them this. Like there's probably federal. I mean, there's definitely federal informants within the group as in with all these types of groups. But it's not d directed by the federal government. They're not going out there and marching around in shields and not really causing any violence, just like kind of marching around for whatever reason to undermine normal conservatives or to encourage the federal government or like whatever. I mean, it's just, they're just doing their thing for whatever reason that they have behind this. Not every pro uh, public demonstration is a fed op, but conservatives on Twitter think that every public demonstration is a fed op and they're opposed to it. So at the same time that these people are always predicting civil war is coming and mass social turmoil, anything time that their side shows up, they're like, this is a fed op. I mean, they even say that about January 6th, which I mean, once again, there's good evidence that there's Asians provocateur and, and informants along the crowd, but the people there showed up on their own accord. Uh, they were brought there by like Trump and the conservative movement. I mean, to Washington, D.C., uh, you know, them going forward, maybe that was led by informants or agents, but the people there were, uh, you know, were not all federal informants or agents and not all Antifa or whatever. I mean, it's like they're ordinary Trump supporters. And so everyone, but everyone always goes to these conspiracy theories and stuff. So even if they did do it, public arbitrations, everyone would like, this is a fed up. We don't buy it. So it's like these riots would then be the first condemned by conservatives or protests. And it's just not going to have it. I mean, I mean, January 6th was, uh, was able to happen because like the idiots in D.C. and the federal government just didn't put any law enforcement resources out in front of the Capitol. You know, they didn't do anything and thus people were able to charge in. That is just not going to happen again. They would pack those guys in. Whoever showed up, first off, conservatives would not be encouraging people to go. Unlike what happened with January 6th to go to Trump's rally. And so where would the riots happen? They are not going to happen. That's like the real factor. I mean, they're just not going to happen. You would see some demonstrations, some small demonstrations. All the demonstrations would be condemned as fed ops by conservatives. And conservative pundits would encourage people not to go. And you would just not have riots. And so I, I think the federal government doesn't have to worry about that. And it's just not going to happen. I mean, there's not going to be this right wing uh, riot violence to happen. I mean, even if you look at something like the George Floyd revolution, you know, right didn't show up. The right didn't show up to challenge them. I mean, for, I mean, for good reason, I think. Uh, I mean, if you can see what happened with Kyle Rittenhouse, but they just don't show up for this stuff. I mean, January 6th is something that was very unprecedented and that it showed right wing street violence, um, which we haven't just not haven't seen in a long time here. And it was a, it was built up over time. It was a reaction to what had happened in the, the BLM riots of 2020 and everyone getting away from it. It was a build up to this feeling that they had stolen the election and that these people were just really, really mad and that they thought that, you know, there would be a change, that they would have stopped the election and Trump would still be president. And then they learned that that was going to happen. And they're just mad about the COVID lockdowns and mad about the BLM riots. And it just all came out into January 6th. And and 900 people got arrested. So the people who were most angry to act out and, you know, go forward and challenge police or whatever and riot uh, are, are uh, currently in jail or have been or have been sentenced. So I just don't see you don't see really see the types of people who are going to be out there and doing that. I mean, 
it, it's once again hoping that Gen Xers and Boomers are going to be your hardcore revolutionary class, and that's just it's just uh, ridiculous to think that. So no, I'm I'm pretty confident there won't be riots. Even if there is a hint of it, say that they do want to do a rally in D.C. or somewhere else, uh, as I outlined the factors, one, the federal government would send thousands, if not tens of thousands of like soldiers and, and law enforcement there to ensure that no riot could even like get off the ground. And two, conservatives would tell everyone not to go. It's a fed op. The FBI set it up to entrap you. Don't go. Probably a smart idea, actually, but. So it's just, you, there's not going to be riots. Uh, I guarantee you that. I would bet on that. I mean, if somehow there are, I don't know how. <laughs> I really don't know how they could occur uh, if a Trump indictment is handed down. So all that leads into the subject is what happens if Trump is indicted? Well, if one, no riots. I did a tweet last week saying what would happen. Now, this was under the impression that there would be an indictment uh, given before the midterms. I don't think there's going to be an indictment for the midterm. So I had one is like it would probably demoralize the base rather than animate them to go out and vote. And one reason it demoralized them is that the Republican Party is dependent on Trump to do these rallies that really energizes the base. He just did one last weekend. It was phenomenal. Like it was really peak Trump, what he was doing, Very all the humor, all the fire and energy. It was great stuff. A lot of great lines from the speech, uh, him attacking Biden and the speech calling him an enemy of the state. It was great stuff. And this fires up the base. And so they are dependent on Trump to do these rallies for the election to get that base motivated to want to vote. I mean, they're having this problem as, as outlined in these special elections are seen in these special elections is they're not getting their people out to vote and they're going to need Trump to do these rallies. And so if he was indicted and maybe even sitting in a jail cell or dealing with the legal issues, he would not be able to uh, do these rallies. And so that, but the, so that factor I don't think is going to be there because I don't think they're going to indict him uh, before the midterms. It looks like they're not. I mean, maybe by the time of the end of this week, I'm proven wrong, but I, I don't think it's going to happen, with, especially with the new developments happening in the case. So that's one thing. But I think if Trump is indicted after the election and depending on what, it, what happens with Republicans, like if Republicans do really well in the midterms, they have a red wave, they gain control of the Senate and the Congress, win some governor seats. It looks like, you know, Republicans really did well and then they indict Trump. Like it's definitely going to have a inflammatory effect on, on the Republican base that they're going to be extremely mad and extremely motivated for 2024 that they're doing this. Now, so I don't know. It's hard to say how that's going to have an effect on the 2024 election because, you know, it happened, you know, two years out. Say it happens on like in the month after the midterms, like it happens in November late this year. You know, it's two years out to see how this is going to play out in the 2024 election. Who knows what comes out in the case? But I think if he is indicted, I have always said that, you know, it had to be a health health scare or some legal trouble to prevent Trump from running. And even when I said with the legal trouble, like he'd probably still run from a jail cell. I do think it lowers the chances of Trump actually running for president. What he would probably do is I think if this happens, if he is indicted and he feels that he's going to lose the case and go to jail, is that he would, you know, step aside if most of the Republican candidates would say that if they got in office, they would grant a full pardon to Trump. And whoever does that will get his support in the general election and he will not run. I think he would make that deal with the Republican Party is that pretty much every candidate would have to agree if they want to win, they would have to agree to granting Trump a full pardon. Now, what candidates would do this? I think a lot of candidates would be skittish to do this. I mean, Republicans are notoriously risk averse and they would see this as like, well, if I if I promise that I won't do well in the general election and maybe I can eke out a victory in the primary just by aping Trump and saying it's awful that what they did to Trump, but not saying I will give a full pardon and who so Trump's going to notice this and Trump may just decide if like none of these candidates are going to do that, that he will run from a jail cell 
and he probably will win. Like, he will be turned into a martyr to the Republican base. I think that, you know, and there's going to be so many people running, deciding to run. They're like, okay, Trump is finished. I'm jumping in. And any type of advantage that Ron DeSantis would have would dissipate if there's like 12 other candidates or maybe even 20 other candidates alongside him and Trump. Like that's his support's going to, you know, be taken away while Trump is going to have, you know, maybe he still will have that 50 percent of Republican support. Maybe he won't if he gets indicted, but he will still have at least a third to probably at least, you know, 40 to maybe 40 percent and possibly at least 50 percent. He would still probably win the primary if he's running from a jail cell or if he's running while under indictment. And he may do that if he feels that the Republican Party is not going to grant him a pardon. Like the only way he knows he can defeat the charges is by running for president. And I mean, this is possible to happen. We don't know. But I think the more likely scenario is that Trump is makes is that a bunch of possible Republican candidates go to him and be like, look, if you support me, I will promise I give you a full pardon when I enter the White House in, in 2025, when I'm inaugurated in January of 2025. And Trump would probably take that deal. I don't think Trump is an old man. You, for any person, nobody wants to go to jail. <laughs> like Nobody wants to go to jail, and especially if you're an old man and you have you face the possibility that you're going to die in jail. Trump does not want to do that. I mean, so does a lot, most people. I mean, I think the vast majority of people would not take that possibility. If you had the opportunity to give to not die in jail and you just don't run for president and you allow somebody to promise a full pardon to you and you're still able to influence politics, I think most people would take that deal. Now, I don't think that's guaranteed. I think Trump being Trump may decide that he may be so angered by this that he really wants to vindicate himself and the best way to vindicate himself is to run for president and he feels that he doesn't trust other republicans to actually fulfill their word and actually give him the pardon when they enter the white house and so he may feel the best way to do this is to run and win the primary now i would say this if he he can win the primary under indictment he cannot win the general election if he's convicted. I mean, if he beats the charges, then, I, I mean, uh, yeah, he could probably win the general election. I mean, that would be a huge victory for him if he beats the charges and he just goes on to win. I mean, I would if, if he beats the charges, I would change my opinion about the general. But if he if he the trial is still going on or if he's convicted, uh, I don't think he's going to win a general election. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm pretty confident about this, that he would not win a general election. But I think he would still win a, a, a primary. Maybe if he's convicted, it might change. But I don't think, I still think even if he's convicted, he would probably win the primary. But I'm pretty sure he would not win the general election. And so, yeah, if he, and somebody probably might tell him this. And that he says that, you know, you will lose both the election and you will then go to jail. And I think Trump maybe say it might be better just to back someone else who would who would have a better chance of winning a general election and him going. Now, this is all predicated on him getting indicted. And this is all predicated him on these charges being solid and them not being thrown out by a judge or, you know, him beating these uh, charges in, in trial. Those are the things that have to be taken away. Maybe Trump is confident that this is not going to hold up and he can win easily. So he just decides to run anyway. And, you know, the charges are thrown out or he beats the charges. I would think that would give him a lot of momentum and it probably make him sweep the primary. No competition. And, you know, it, it would, you know, take away some of his... Uh, you know, maybe it might hurt him in a general election, but so does the two impeachments. So it's it would if he beats the charges, it's just adding another thing that I don't think any person who <laughs> would have considered voting for Trump would change their mind if just because of an indictment that he that he beat. If it's thrown out, it shows that it's silly and shows him as a persecuted and, and furthers along this martyr uh, image that he has. But um, you know, I don't I don't. <laughs> I don't know how certain it would be that that would happen. I would say if they, if he's indicted and he's brought to trial, a judge doesn't throw it. A judge doesn't throw it out. Uh, I would bet on conviction, unfortunately, and that would be very bad. Like this is all very bad if Trump is indicted. Like I haven't fully wrapped my head around it because it is such an event that 
would be catastrophic for a lot of what we build up and what our hopes were. Because for all of Trump's faults, Trump is a change to the status quo. Trump is furthering along what we believe in much more so than any other candidate. And yeah, you can say like, well, DeSantis is more competent. DeSantis really believes this stuff. It's like DeSantis doesn't instinctually believe this stuff. Trump does. Trump is willing to say things and do things that no other Republican is going to do. All the, all, every other Republican is going to have these personnel problems, especially when you look at DeSantis. DeSantis hired a horrible neocon to run his uh, press, uh, press shop after Christina Pushaw left him. Pushaw is a neocon herself, but this guy like that he hired is like pro unlimited free trade, pro like foreign interventions everywhere. And this is who he got to run his press shop, to be his new, his new press secretary. And also another thing that people don't want to mention is that, you know, with all these busing going on with the migrants and like them saying like, oh yeah, like, you know, whether your opinion on that or not, is that DeSantis is not doing the busing because the Cuban lobby told him not to do that. So I think he would be limited on what he would do on immigration because the Cuban lobby would have the final word over what he does. And so he wouldn't be that type of transformative, charismatic candidate that Trump is. I mean, just look at Trump's rally from last weekend. Like, it was phenomenal. It was on fire. Like, people were, like, at a rock concert. Like, people were fired up. You could not have that with DeSantis. Like, DeSantis... I and mean, like for all his good things, like he does not have the charisma. He's got a terrible voice. Not like I can, uh, I mean, I don't have the greatest voice on earth, but he has just such, I keep getting these ads for him on YouTube and he's like, hi, I'm Ryan DeSantis and, and Florida, we're getting back to business. And it just, it, it's not the type of fire and enthusiasm. Like he would not have that type of rally that Trump has where it's just like people are roaring in approval and they're just like, they're, they're just excited and thrilled. Like people would probably like his message, but I mean, he's reading from note cards and and canned jokes. It just wouldn't work. So what does the dissident right do? What do nationalists do if they arrest our guy, Donald Trump, or uh, indict Donald Trump? Where do we go from here? Do we just give up, throw up our hands and like we're done with politics and we, I don't know, move on to whatever all these other people always say. It's like, vote harder. And it's like, what are you doing? I'm tweeting harder. I'm posting on Gab harder. It's like, I don't think that's, I don't think that's challenging the regime. So what do we do? Uh, for that, I, it, that's almost have to be a uh, bridge will cross when we come to it. I have to think, I still haven't fully wrapped my, as I said before, I haven't fully wrapped my mind around it. I think when it comes to politics, I mean, first off, Trumpism in America first is not finished. If Trump is indicted, we still and depending on what happens in the elections, like maybe Blake Masters and people like that get into Congress. It really does show the power of this message. Trump's still going to be a powerful figure. People are going to be still be seeking his endorsement, especially in the presidential uh, primary. And he's still going to have a ton of influence. And so you have to ask, like, well, where does that lead us or where does that mean for us? And I still think it's. Um, you know, it's not the, I would not say it's the end of the world. It's just, a, it's a bad thing. It's a major setback, but it's not the end of the world. We still have to continue with our struggle and what we're doing. And like just giving up on normal politics and saying it's all done. And you basically were retreating and escaping. Generally, people just don't have an alternative and they just drop out of politics in general and they just become standard normies who understand the truth and then they watch the world change around them and they're helpless to do anything but then they say that this is the real uh thing to actually change the world which i uh i think is uh rather silly or they get involved in some like stupid type of extremism and further ghettoize themselves and further like alienate themselves from their friends and family and they may face charges for something stupid they did. So those are the type of things with happen. I would say, you know, depending on how the election goes and depending on how uh, the response is to Trump's indictment, I think we'll go from there. I will say this, like a lot of conservatives are going to tell you to move on from Trump and just love DeSantis. Like we can finally threaten the system with with Ron DeSantis, who's not going to jail and is not threatened with jail time. And they'll, there'll be so many people saying this, but whoever offers Trump a pardon and has the closest America first message, we would, we would probably have to support, but not with, with not with, without the type of enthusiasm we gave towards Trump. I don't think you would ever type of generate that type of enthusiasm and support 
for another candidate as you would with somebody else. And so I, I think it's it's hard to say what we do in that case. I think it is it does change the course of what we're doing for 2024. I mean, we want Trump to run again and we want him to win a second term. But an indictment would make that more difficult and would decrease the chances of that happening. I mean, we have to be realistic here. And it doesn't end it. It doesn't it doesn't permanently end it. And it's also not guaranteed that he's indicted. I mean, him not getting indicted would be a major deal. That would be a major relief. Uh, we're white pill. We are back. We are so back, guys. And we would, uh, and of course, Trump, if he isn't indicted, he would just easily sail to the nominee nomination and would then compete in the general election. And hopefully he'd win. So we'd have to, but all these things that we have, it's a bridge wheel cross when we get there. And it's, um, I'm not committal at this moment on what, on what we think and what we should do in that scenario. And I'll, mainly, I would just say I, it would still not change like dramatically what my intention. It's not like I'm going to be like, oh, the only solution is national divorce or civil war now or these other silly things. Of course, I'm not going to say that. But I think it would be change maybe how we approach politics, how we present ourselves if something like that occurs. I think it would it would be a major setback for us and trying to cope and be like, well, DeSantis is better. That that is not the case. I mean, DeSantis is DeSantis really shows conservative Inc. adopting America first, like stylings and some of his policies, but reincorporating it within conservative Inc. framework and using the same people. And I think people need to face up to that. I would still like if he's the nominee and he's promising a pardon for Trump, I would still support him and still vote for him. Uh, but I would not be that enthusiastic about it. I wouldn't be like a huge DeSantis cheerleader, and and I would probably say that would be our main, or the main goal we would do in the 2024 election. But once again, that's a bridge we'll cross when we get there, and I think it's a little too early to say what we would do in that scenario. Now moving on to the next topic is Joe Biden's declaration of war on MAGA Republicans, on Donald Trump supporters. I think for one thing. I well to, for those who may not know what I'm talking about, I think pretty much everyone does. Is Biden gave a very bizarre speech where he leaned into the dark Brandon meme, where he had an imposing background lit up in ominous red lighting and Marines flanking him as he said that MAGA Republicans aren't true Americans and they're a threat to democracy and we must get rid of them from our politics and blah blah blah. America is based on ideas and liberty, freedom, equality, etc. Same dumb platitudes. I mean, it was just a list of, of standard platitudes that America politicians have said time and time again, added with this like MAGA Republicans are a threat to democracy and don't believe what we believe. And they deny uh, blacks the right to vote and, and the freedom to choose what you do with your body and the freedom to choose abortion. That was the same, but everything else besides that was standard platitudes. As even a lot of these conservatives were saying, you know, the message of this was like terrible, but a lot of conservatives were just like fixated on just the lighting and optics while they're like, I think he had a great message. It was a very stirring American message, but really the lighting and optics were just terrible. This goes back to a point I made in a Revolver article earlier this year when Biden gave his uh, State of the Union address. Or he talked about how we're all stand for Ukraine and everyone's like, oh, yeah, that is. And then Republicans just fixated on these tiny details on this minutia and they felt that this was the real difference. And they got so angry about it and so worked up about it. And this is really what Republicans want us to keep doing. It's like, like we agree on the basics with Democrats. We love the we love seeing America as just an idea that's open to all and freedom, liberty, equality. But the real differences are just these like the shoes Biden wears or, or his tone. And these are what really divides us. And that's just uh, silly and stupid. And I think we need to avoid that. But there was a lot of that coming from Biden's speech now. But. All that was the kind of pettiness was set aside to just like everyone saying that this is like a very bizarre speech. This looked like Biden trying to be a dictator and declaring war, at least coming from conservatives, that is. There was a few never Trumpers like uh, Jonah Goldberg who were just doing the minutia a bit. But most people on the right were saying about how uh, shocking the speech was and how uh, unprecedented it was and how it does make Biden appear to be a dictator. 
And so why did Biden do this speech? I mean, it was like a weird speech and it didn't get rave reviews. I mean, a lot of liberals were criticizing it. Like people from CNN were, were like, this is a little too much. Washington Post criticized it. You know, there was not only people like Jennifer Rubin and others were like the super uh, Biden fans were just like, this was amazing. And like Richard Spencer. <laughs> so uh, the real super Biden fans were the only ones who were thrilled with the speech. And which is like really funny about Spencer because I mean, he keep Biden keeps bringing up about how Charlottesville motivated him to go to the to run for president and change America. And he keeps bringing up Charlottesville. And it's like, I wonder who was involved in that. But uh, that's a tale <laughs> for another time. So it's just like those people are the only ones who are really into the Biden speech. Everyone else was just like, this is weird or at least saying it's weird and like probably something a president shouldn't do to this is Biden wanting to announce he's a dictator. So why did Biden do this? I mean, the explanation I have is, uh, I gave on Twitter is probably the best. It's like all of his staffers are obsessed with the dark branded meme. Like they're always sharing it. They're always like the dark Brandon. And it's like so bad. It's like the malarkey ends here. It's not like dark MAGA where he's actually doing like, uh, you know, it's like a very funny nihilistic meme and dark humor. Dark Brandon is like, I'm ending uh, student, uh, I'm cutting student loan debt, deal with the Republicans. And it's like a dark background. And it's like, how is this like Dark Brandon? Anyway, they're obsessed with Dark Brandon and they're like, let's do Dark Brandon for real. And so they set it up like this. They got the ominous red lighting and the at night and the soldiers there. And they're like, let's everyone loves Dark Brandon. Let's let's lean into Dark Brandon. And then they're like, what the hell is this? Like people don't know what Dark Brandon is. And Dark Brandon was like done both by the far right and far left as a joke to make fun of how Biden is a senile like idiot who can't get anything done and then like the white house and mainstream liberals believe it is like he is actually dark brandon and so they're doing this and they wanted like biden to be like the malarkey ends here i'm waging war on conservatives and did it did it hit uh no it didn't so that's the main reason why he did it another reason is that biden did this speech because he's aware that the doj wants to indict trump and he wants to send a threatening message to his supporters that we will not tolerate any political violence and we will not tolerate anything from you. Look at the Marines behind me. Look at how threatening I am. I will promise a un unbelievable destruction if you try anything on a republic. And he had just done this a few days before, like a day before. He was like, you're going to need, we have got Air Force. We've got, you're going to need a, some fighter jets to take us on. And it's like, if you try to deal with us and the government, we're going to get fighter jets to blow you up. And it's like, uh, of course, he didn't say that explicitly, but it was like the implied purpose of his speech in there. And he keeps using these arguments as like they have no chance against the mil American military might. And he's very eager to, to say he will use American military might against those he feels uh, dispute his government policies. But back to the point about it indicating that they are likely to indict Trump is that he gave this speech to first off intimidate uh, Trump supporters that they wouldn't do anything. And second, it is like sending a message that the administration and the federal government are fully committed to bringing these people to justice. And it was, I think, a design to convince American people that Trump and the MAGA Republicans are such a threat that we have to bring charges against them. I don't think it worked in that regard, but they felt it was. And also, of course, um, Biden's affirmative action press secretary was like, it wasn't a political speech. Uh, excuse me. It wasn't a political. There's nothing political about attacking MAGA Republicans. And um, of course, so uh, it, it's such a bizarre, but they all make up their own standards. I mean, they don't have to abide by our standards and, and pretend what they do. So, of course, it's a non-political speech to attack uh, your political opponents with Marines uh, flanking your side. It's just non-political. It's non-partisan. Only partisans would say otherwise. And so people just want to believe this about Biden. But how would the speech come along? I think we're going to remember it because it's just such odd. And Biden's going to keep doing these weird things as they're for some reason putting him out on the campaign trail to campaign for candidates. And Biden's not popular and Biden is like old and senile. He just keeps giving gifts to Republicans when he's on the trail. He gets too angry. There's one time there's like a huge, they're like, there's a huge crowd to see him. And it's like, 
dozens of people at most in Pennsylvania there to see him. So I don't know why they have him campaigning. I think it's like because John Fetterman in Pennsylvania can't campaign for himself. So they're sending Joe Biden out to campaign for him. I don't think that this is going to work, um, but they're just doing their other thing. So we're going to see a lot more of these type of speeches from Biden uh, going into the midterms. But I think the main takeaway from it is one is this it reiterates the point that Democrats do see us as their main enemy. It is not a foreign threat that they see as a main enemy. It's not Russia. It's not China. It's not Islamic terrorism. It is us. It is the it is the middle Americans that they see as the number one threat. It's why they always keep saying is white supremacy is the number one threat to America. They keep emphasizing that point. It's because they see conservative white Americans as their greatest threat and they want to suppress them and they want to intimidate us into compliance and into submission. And that is the primary purpose of that speech. Now, how is that going to play out? I, I think the message it backfired for Trump or for not for Trump, but for Biden going into the midterms of what message he wants to convey to the American public. It's not a winning message to to say this stuff. It probably alienated and weirded out some people. And it's just, it just didn't have the intended effect. If he really wanted to bring the country together to support charges against Trump, which is probably an impossible feat, he would have like you know, a speech in the White House and be a, you know, a friendly speech and be like, you know, we're all Americans. We're all like that. And he would just highlight how Trump, the individual, is wrong and everything he's done wrong, not encapsulate all his supporters and the Republican Party within that. And then his like claim is like, this isn't all Republicans. There's some Republicans who will support my entire agenda. I guess he's just meaning like Susan Collins and Lisa Murkowski, but... Um, so it was just like a bad tone if he wanted to do it. It's, if he wanted to do it, he would isolate Trump the individual. But Trump the individual is not who they who they hate and who they want eliminated and who they want suppressed. It's his supporters. It's the middle Americans, and that's why they, they're using this term MAGA Republicans. And I guess they've changed it from ultra MAGA. None of these things really stick, and I think Republicans just adopt it as their new um, identification. And um, so we'll see what happens with that. I, I think it was mostly a dud, but I think the other big takeaway is this, is that Biden would not give that speech if he was not confident that his, his DOJ is going to indict Trump at some point. And the hidden purpose or underlying purpose of it was to prepare Americans for that possibility and for him to say, we will use the awesome power of American military might against anyone who has a problem with us indicting Trump. And that's really what we have to see his speech for. Now, one final topic before we get to the convoluted question is one funny thing I've seen a lot on. And I, I know I'm trying to avoid like just esoteric right wing Twitter discussions. But this is one quick thing I just wanted to have. And it's not the it's only going to be a brief segment in a podcast. But I do want to carry on this subject is one thing I've been talking about is the normie idolization. And I've and I've gone into that more and I briefly alluded to that talking about Trump and like what people should do to moving forward. And a lot of people have come under the impression that the most revolutionary act you can do is to like grill and like be a normal like suburban dad who and going to JV and 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 high school football games is really what we need to aspire to and like and do. It's like it's like if you look at a political action plan for a lot of people, they will say the building blocks are it's like basic things you do in life. It's like like have a job. Okay, I think everyone has a job. Get married. I think everyone wants to get married. Have a family. I think everyone wants to have a family. Uh grill. Okay. And then uh, get really involved in JV and high school football because this is where the revolution is going to come from. And like, what? And they came to a four because somebody shared a photo of these three studs who play for, I think they play for USC football. Three like very good looking white guys and they're just standing there and like this. And like these guys don't know who Andrew Tate is or what red pill means. And they probably do know who Ray Andrew Tate is. They may have some vague awareness of what red pill is. But the point is, is saying like these guys 
are the pinnacle of masculinity and they just don't know about this stuff because they're just being the pinnacles of masculinity. And it's like, yeah, it's obvious. Like these guys aren't going to be into that stuff because life is given to them. I mean, they've got incredible genetics. They're, they're, they're incredible athletes that they are playing for a major college program. They look, they're good looking guys. Like, why would they question the world around them? I think people need to understand that. Not saying like everyone is like a ugly nerd on our side. I don't even think the majority is. But you generally, if you are at the top of the world throughout your life, which you would be if you are a top tier, good looking athlete, you're probably not going to question the world around you unless something, you know, event happened. Maybe there was like a robbery at your house and like that made you question things or just something bad happened. Even when you're a top tier athlete that made you question things. Only something like that can make you question it. But otherwise, like this is a person like in the society we live in, these guys or have the world at their hands for the time being. I mean, they probably aren't going to make it to the pros and maybe after they done with college, maybe they'll, you know, they're working a normal job and they'll have more time to consider things and how the world works. And then they'll begin to question things when they're no longer that, you know, big man on campus. But if the you are the top of the world in our society, you're not... You're not the one of the people who question it. They probably have good instincts. They may, if you talk to them about this stuff, they'd probably like, oh yeah, I agree. Uh, but they're not going to be the ones to like, <laughs> uh, you know, question these things. I think it's probably pretty obvious. as like, who are the young people getting into this stuff? And that's not like a problem with our side, but it's like, it's just funny that people use that. It's like, hey, look at these guys who have the world at their fingertips. Like they're not into this stuff, so neither should you be. And it's like, well, I'm not going to be a top tier athlete at you <laughs> and play college football for USC. So I'm not, it's, you really can't compare the circumstances. Not saying like everyone is like a loser or anything, as I've already emphasized, but it's like this viral clip and some people may not know what I'm talking about. So to backtrack, it was a viral photo. This is a viral tweet. And then people began making jokes about it and using this photo to make their own points. This also go, went along with another photo of a, of a high school football player making out with his cheerleader. And for some reason, this like photo really caused a lot of uh, controversy on, on Twitter. Well, one guy like Wignat said, this is what the Jews stole from you. And it's like, uh, <laughs> uh, if you want to say that on publicly, like, go right ahead. I mean, if you want to take the loser pill, sure, go, go for it. I don't think, I don't think, uh, I don't think anyone stole that away from you, but Sure, go ahead and say that. And then there was like liberals saying like this this photo really crushes people because they'll know they'll never be like this. And this is this this inspires a, a wave of rage and stuff. So those two like pictures really cause a lot of people is like, you know, I think liberals for some reason were using it to mock like right wingers and incels and then incels were sometimes using the wrong message from it. And so it's just like weird things, but they do emphasize this point, uh, you know, regardless of the discussion of these two photos, it does go back to this normy idolization or these kind of like idolization of things that the average suburban American cares about and says that this is like the revolutionary act and like this is what we need to focus on, like stop focusing on politics. Let's focus on grilling instead. And... Uh, I mean, I know where they're coming from with this, but, and don't get me wrong, it's not wrong to do these things. It's not terrible to do these things. You actually should do, do these things, but they're the basic minimum of what people do. And even a lot of our enemies, like they always like to say is like liberals don't want you to be healthy and to have children and families and, and put your kids into team sports. And it's like a lot of liberals do this. If you look at liberal elites, like they are, they're health nuts. They're putting their kids through elite sports. They are, you know, eating very healthy and all these things. Uh, they're having families too. They're grilling too. It's not the revolutionary act. So it's really just turning these like mundane things into like the regime does not want you to do, does not want you to fire up the grill. And I was like, I'm pretty sure the regime does not care. The regime does not want your kid to do, go for tryouts. It's like, I'm pretty sure the regime just doesn't care. I mean, they're not banning high school football from uh, any, any type of perspective I want to know. So in some ways, this is just a, a lot of the people who get really into this stuff are not the ones experiencing it or they are experiencing it and they are trying to, 
I don't I wouldn't say rationalize because I don't want to say that these are negative activities. I think that's the wrong word to use. But to imagine that what they're doing is this deep threat to the revolution to the regime. And if like more people did this, then it would just fall over and topple. A lot of people argue this stuff, too. They're like, this is how the Soviet Union fell. It's like the Soviet Union didn't fell because people began focusing on uh, Pop Warner hockey. <laughs> I don't think they have Pop Warner. They, of course, didn't call him Pop Warner, but they did not because they began focusing on youth hockey. You know, this is just like the ways that a lot of the ways this is ways people use to cope with the regime rather than to overthrow it. It's like as long as they're allowed to have like a you know, private space where they're able to have a family and they can go to the high school football game. And not much has changed since then when they were playing high school football in the 90s or 2000s. I mean, it's actually really weird thinking that now like people of the 2000s uh, who are playing then would now have kids. Probably actually a little bit too early. But so let's say 80s and 90s. And now that they can go there and see their son play and it's not not too different and so it creates a degree of continuity and they're able to focus on their family and they're still able to grill. And ultimately this makes them accept the current regime's orders rather than to overthrow it. Because as long as they're able to do these things, as long as they're able to have a, a sense of the good life, as long as they're have, able to have you know, some sense of normality, I mean, if they turn on the TV, they may see the decline. If they go out to the city, they may see the decline. But the decline is not there at the high school football game. And so that's like the case. And are these people going to serve as the revolutionary class? I don't think so. <laughs> these are these are people with a lot to lose, and they're also older, and they just they don't have the fire in the bellies or even the type of physical ability to you know wage a guerrilla war. Uh, so as long as we still have these type of things, I don't really want to say they're diversions because I mean it's like there's a positive aspect to this stuff about this normie activities. But you are not doing anything to threaten anyone or to change the world by focusing in on this stuff and then just idolizing it to an, to an irrational degree that we have. I know this is kind of internal uh, right-wing discourse, but it comes at the point where if like right-wingers see liberals do anything that they associate with being base, like, uh, like an example of Mark Zuckerberg taking up boxing and being physically fit, and now, like, all these guys are like, oh, Zuckerberg kind of based. And it's like, no. <laughs> it's like, these lifestyle activities are not what makes, you know, when you replace politics or when you replace lifestyle activities, or let me go back. When you replace politics with lifestyle activities and it sense that this is what needs to be done, then you could end up idolizing a lot of our worst enemies and worst oppressors. So you shouldn't do that. And it's like not like you should like tell your kid like don't play high school football, just focus on on being a shit poster online. I like not of course not saying that, and I certainly do not advocate. I probably would advocate the opposite, but I would just say that like to a lot of these people who just think like I, I did like if they have a kid and they have a family, they're like the regime is on is on suicide watch. It's like no, it's not. The regime still wants people to have kids, maybe not a lot of kids. Uh, and they certainly want to change what values you're teaching them, but they don't want you to just completely have no children and not have your children in, in playing like team sports and stuff. It's like it, it's just a um, a silly caricature that people have, and then they they imagine a straw man of what the regime is like, what the global American empire is like, and then they imagine that what they do in their day to day life is like a threat to it. When the regime is just like, uh, no, we're fine with this. <laughs> it's uh, you're doing as told, and this is just way of you coping and accepting the order, the present order, rather than threatening it or change it. So, those are some th thoughts on that. A little bit of a ramble. Some people may be like, "What is Scott talking about?" But it's just something I wanted to talk talk about a, a little bit. I think, and you could see this with. Um, a lot of conservatives like into this. I think they're just like too em emphasizing these lifestyle activities and lifestyle decisions rather than understanding what we're up against and how to change it. And they believe that just like focusing in on these lifestyle habits that they'll make a change. It's like no, it's it's more the opposite. But it's not saying these are bad and you should still do these things. But uh, need to be uh, realistic about what it's accomplishing or what it's not accomplishing. 
Now on to the Cognitive Elite questions. And as a reminder, you too can get the power to ask me questions or suggest guests and topics if you sign up for the Cognitive Elite option at Highly Respected Substack. And that's at highlyrespected.substack.com. And if you haven't already, make sure to sign up for the IQ Supplements while you're there. And of course, if you're signed up for the Cognitive Elite option, you're also signed up for the IQ Supplements. So this question comes from Tony. Tony is wondering, it's like he's been seeing some tweets of me uh, mocking some of the World Economic Forum um, emphasis, and he was wondering what what is my thoughts on World Economic Forum and and why I am uh, doing some jokes. So I've been having some jokes. What I've been seeing is that there's a certain type of I don't want to call it necessarily fully Infowars, but Infowar s because a lot of these people are also like Joe Rogan types and people from much more mainstream corners are just like mainstreamish libertarian types who are really fixated on the WEF and Klaus Schwab. And this should, and it and it's it's it was all this obsession comes from a, from an episode of Joe Rogan that I think aired last year. I think it was uh so like a British Muslim guy who went on about like how the WEF and all these world leaders are um have done their programs or been funded by them or I don't not funded, but like been involved in the WEF. And so now people believe that like, this is the big global conspiracy that people have gone into. And the WEF is just responsible for polarizing the country and doing all these terrible things is like, what is the WEF doing here? And so it's replaced like new world order or the Illuminati or Bilderbergs as like the new puppet masters of world globalism and what's happening in the world and you'll see this coming from all different types and so some of my tweets are like mocking uh these like libertarians that you'll see it's like what we need is peace and love but the wef wants us at each other's throats why don't we come together and like smoke a doobie and stuff and that's really what they want us to do and um i don't think that's once again threatening the wf i just think i i i think it's coming from a good place, I think it's like good that people are questioning elites and seeing them as like hostile to their interests. But if so, on a popular level, it's like good as a popular meme. But I also have to say, like we are trying to stand up for the truth and be factual and, and you know, no matter where the truth goes, we'll stand up for the truth. It, you know, blaming the WEF is just not true. Like WEF is an extension of the globalist American empire. Like Schwab and a lot of these people are goofballs. They are supporting the global, uh, the great reset and all these other stuff. Like, I'm not saying they're great people, but like it, it's, you're missing the big picture of like what's making our life terrible. Instead of focusing on like looking at these like terrible, like affirmative action style state we have in this country or the civil rights regime or what the globalist American empire does and it promotes through its foreign policy, you're instead fixated on like Klaus Schwab trying to depopulate the world. And they are obsessed with these like population control narratives. They're like, they're trying to kill us all. And it's like, uh, I mean, some people like population control is no longer a popular idea. It hasn't been in for the last like 40 years. Uh, even liberals get like very queasy when you bring it up. Like remember that Emmanuel Macron and, Bernie Sanders both said that like maybe some type of population control should be in effect in Africa. There's too many. They're having problems with overpopulation and the entire left came out against them. So it's like people like these Schwab and other types. I mean, they do imagine like a global technocracy that, you know, administers the world and everyone just gets along. But that's just never going to happen. And these national interests are matter more than what the WEF is. And the WEF only has power insofar as it's allied and an extension of the of the globalist American empire and its values. And I think it's much better to look at how the American system operates and what's before our eyes than to imagine these conspiracy theories that that are out there. And when one thing with WEF is that it, it, the fixation on it eliminates the type of uncomfortable truths that come out when you focus on America. You know, the uncomfortable truths about them promoting a lot of the race stuff, them promoting a lot of the LGBT stuff. Instead, we just imagine that these like secretive billionaires are exploiting and 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 dividing the working man from the real interests. And we're going to overthrow these global scumbags to have the people in charge again. And it's not a message you can be canceled for be, for being a bigot. You know, it's a it's a uh, type of libertarian populism, I would say. And so it's much more, 
you're not going to. So blaming them is not as bad as blaming some other uh, actors that other conspiracy theorists wanted to blame. So blaming the WEF and seeing them as like the evil puppet master behind all this, it's not the worst thing in the world. And I guess it moves people in the right direction, you could say. But it's not just not truthful. It's not accurate about what we're facing. And it also leads into just more wholesome chungus populism of debt. We just eliminate all these billionaires and that all their problems go away. And it's like a lot of the issues that you face are not directed by Klaus Schwab or these other people. It's directed by DMV ladies. It's directed by the civil rights regime. It's directed by people you can see here and now. And it's not like the WEF is like controlling the levers of making everything there. I'm, as you guys should know, I'm not into conspiracy theories. I don't, I don't, even though some things are labeled conspiracy theories, I think a lot of times it just leads to people wanting to give themselves an entertainment value out of their politics rather than answering uh, questions truthfully and accurately. I don't think the WEF stuff is that into conspiracy theory. Most of the stuff they highlight is like truthful, but I, I think it's also like they have everyone on the compromise because they signed up for a WEF fellowship or they spoke at a WEF event. It's just where like world leaders meet and interact. And these people are not bound to WEF. It's not like Putin is bound to the WEF. Putin is not like listening. It's just a way for him to grow his economy. That's why he goes there. It's just a tool that the, an event they go to like the G7 or something else. It's not something that dictates their actions and controls who they are. A lot of these people act independently. Really what controls actions is America is the globalist American empire. The globalist American empire is telling Europe to cut off its energy supplies to spite Russia. The globalist American empire forces a lot of these countries to take in more immigrants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to look at what's in front of you and what's actually causing these things and not just blame a safe target for these problems and where this seeing the safe target as the root of problems it leads you to adopt cringe politics that distract you from the root issues and the core issues of our time and so that's my thoughts on the wef i might do talk about it more at length uh in the future but that's it for today that is completely it for today both in that topic and the show hope you guys enjoyed we're gonna have an incredible iq supplement later this week so tune in for that so until next time stay respected <laughs>